The Georgia coast is really a special place. It's not just the beautiful islands and the incredible coastlines, but there are a lot of opportunities for conservation action that have significant impacts across really the whole hemisphere when we're thinking about shorebirds. My name is Abby Sterling. I work for Manomet, which is a nonprofit that focuses on coastal conservation, and I'm the director of our Georgia Bite Shorebird Conservation Initiative. There are a lot of partners that have dedicated their lives and careers to protecting shorebirds. With this initiative, what we're really trying to do is increase collaboration, uh, increase capacity, and bring together all of the partners that are working on shorebird conservation so that we can help protect shorebird habitat um, and help to uh, increase populations of shorebirds that travel through or nest in our area. Originally, I'm from Western New York, so I didn't even know that the Georgia coast existed until I came down in 2007 actually to do sea turtle work. So I was on a barrier island, Little St. Simons Island. I got to be a naturalist out there and really started to learn about coastal ecology, the shorebirds that use our Georgia coast and just fell in love with their story. The Georgia Barrier Islands were recognized by the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network, which we affectionately call WISERN, um, as important for shorebirds. So creating a network of places that are committed to, to shorebird conservation. And we are a critical part of that here. Because of the shape of the coastline, we've got a lot of different features that happen on the landscape here. You see these expansive salt marshes, huge mud flats and sandbars. So all of these different features are creating kind of the perfect recipe for shorebirds. So every year we have about 300,000 shorebirds that come through the Georgia coast. Some of those birds may spend the winter here in the southeast, but others travel from Tierra del Fuego, the very southern part of South America, and all of these red knots nest in the Arctic tundra, and they've got key stopover places that they depend on. They have very high site fidelity. So they know where the food resources are good and where they've got quiet beaches to rest on so that they can really build the energy reserves that they need. During the spring, horseshoe crabs come ashore at the full in the moon, new moon tides once the water warms up and they lay their eggs right along the tide line. And if we think about how shorebird migration has actually evolved with horseshoe crab spawning. To me, it's just, you've got this sort of timeless link that happens every single spring on our coast. And it happens all along the Atlantic coast. Um, so they'll fuel up here on horseshoe crabs and then take off and fly four or five days straight without stopping, flapping their wings the whole entire time to get up to the Arctic. So you can just imagine the kind of energy resources that they need and the importance of this place for those birds when they're on those journeys. I think one of the most important things that we spend a lot of time doing is education and outreach because we really want people to be able to understand what they're seeing when they're here. There's so many incredible things um, that, that they get to experience on the Georgia coast. Uh, but without really understanding the backstory, you know, they can cause unintentional disturbance and that goes for our migratory shorebirds, it goes for our nesting shorebirds. So we get to do a lot of um, taking people out, showing them what's actually happening on the ground so that they know how to interact. So we're really trying to think through all of the different ways that people love our coast and use our coast um, and interact with them so that they understand the stories of the shorebirds that truly depend on this place. It's really helpful uh, if they stay on the wet sand. Walking around flocks of birds, get excited about shorebirds, learn who they are, and share their stories with people when they're out on the beach too. I would say we're seeing we're seeing some really interesting impacts of climate change, for sure. A few years ago, there was a paper that came out that, that described three billion fewer birds here in our world than there were in the 1970s. And shorebirds are one of the groups that are hit the hardest. But I think we're also broadly seeing a greater awareness and an increase in appreciation for shorebird conservation. I feel myself a great deal of optimism when we think about how much more we know about this place, new technology that's just shocking us with the things that we were learning about shorebirds that we thought we knew, but now realizing more nuance and more understanding about how we need to protect these individual places. The story of the shorebirds really helps us understand that our individual impacts make a difference. So every little drop in the bucket is critical. And I think getting to teach people about that, even the little guys, is, is the way to do that. My son, who's just about a year and a half, so he's only just picked up binoculars 
and looked through them. You know, getting to, to connect people with this place so they understand it and so that we can make sure it stays this incredible habitat that it is.